Thank you, Skip. So uh, to begin with, I want to say it's good to be home. I see a lot of uh, familiar faces out there and a lot of people who have uh, you know, given me encouragement along the way, so that means a lot to me. Um, as Skip mentioned, I am a Little Rock native and a former newspaper reporter. And I'm sure uh, many of you wonder why I wrote a book about this topic. Um, so I want to first preface this by saying I'm no expert on African American history or African American culture. I don't pretend to be, but I care a lot about sports. So on the sports side, I'm going to begin there to, right now. Uh, since childhood, I have been a huge fan of football and basketball, and in particular, I've always followed the Razorbacks. In the 90s, Nolan Richardson, Todd Day, Cordless Williamson, Sky Thurman, and the rest took Razorback basketball to the mountaintop, and it made me feel a sense of pride in that realm that I think some of you out there might have felt as well. And I grew up in the Pine Valley area of Central, Ar of Central Little Rock, but I always felt a little different from my friends who had two American parents. My father is a native Turk, and uh, his language, you know, growing up sounded so different, so strange, and his points of reference seemed so foreign. And there, so there's no, just to kind of lay it out, there was no deer hunting, there was no frog gigging or Little League baseball in my childhood. Just wanted to make sure you, that was clear. But there was neighborhood pickups of basketball and of football, and there was eternal talk of hogs football and basketball, and those kinds of things helped me feel like I was one of a tribe. In the late 90s, I attended Little Rock Central High, and there uh, my classmates and I kind of took pride in our own powerhouse basketball program. Uh, those teams featured Joe Johnson, who'd go on to be a seven-time NBA All-Star and three other uh, future Division I starters. And as much as sports kind of served as a uh, common ground for conversations in our classrooms, so did civil rights history. This was uh, during the 40th anniversary of the Central High Crisis and the 57th integration of our school, and it sparked a deluge of national attention, just as you're seeing now during the 60th. Um, I remember my mindset as a teenager, though, was much different than it is now. I, I thought of public history as something that was decided on and executed by professionals. You know, history seemed to be important dates that had been placed into textbooks, seemed to be plaques, grainy video that was sh shown in museums. Um, when I skipped statistics class one day to go visit the new museum that had been built in the Esso station across the street, I hadn't even considered what public history meant. Um, back then, I had the sense that whatever it was, it was kind of one and the same with the institutions that conveyed it to future generations. And since then, I realize that isn't the case. <clears throat> so I want to get into why, but before I do, I want to provide some background. And to that end, I want to share one of those forgotten public history stories in this book. On the cover, you see a, black ref a reference to black Razorbacks. Some here remember that when it comes to Razorback football, it was the likes of Daryl Brown and John Richardson who are some very important Razorback football pioneers. Uh, and they had basketball counterparts in Lewis Bryant and then Thomas Johnson. But decades before, in Fayetteville, there was a group of young African-American men who were also called the black Razorbacks. In the Great Depression, they formed a community football team which played all black teams from Joplin to Russellville to Fort Smith. And we do not have any photos of these unofficial Razorbacks in action, but we know they wore hand-me-down uniforms from the official Razorbacks and hand-me-downs from the Fayetteville White Bulldogs, or the Fayetteville Bulldogs, which was an all-white team, and one of the teams they scrimmaged. So my friends, uh, Caleb Hardwick, who's here today, and Jerry Hogan in Fayetteville helped me track down the only known detailed retrospect of that team, written by, in 85 by a Fayetteville native named Arthur Friedman. Arthur Friedman was a Fayetteville High Bulldog around 1930, and he recalled that the Black Razorbacks' second team scrimmaged the Bulldogs on the grounds of the segregated UA itself. Uh, volunteer Razorback coaches even trained them on, their, on the side. 
When they played at the UA's practice field, they got routed by the whites, according to Friedman. Things changed, however, when they played a few miles away in the black part of town. And I'm going to get a book right quick and read it to you. I almost remembered everything except this. Okay. He's talking about when the when they were playing in the hollow, the black part of town of Fayetteville, he writes, with the black maidens cheering them on from the sidelines, we didn't have a chance, Friedman recalled. They dragged us up on one side of the field and down the other. The game usually ended when we were so battered that we didn't have anyone physically sound enough to continue the struggle. Friedman added he hung up his cleats for good after Sandy York of the Black Razorbacks cracked three bones in Friedman's left rib on a tackle. Around the same time, Fable High starting fullback Ray Hinkle was sidelined from two playoff games because of a bruised shoulder he'd sustained in scrimmaging against these black Razorbacks on a Sunday. Hinkle's coach never knew that was the cause, Friedman added. So time passed and Friedman grew up. He became a teacher and at some point he moved away from Fayetteville. He doesn't say it outright, but between those macho moments of the long throws and the rough tackles, he spent time getting to know his black friends. And while society precluded any chance of them sharing a classroom, they still felt free to build bonds uh, through the football field. He wrote, I grew morally and spiritually as a result of playing with the black kids. It was easy to learn that the only difference between us was the pigment of our skins. So this is a guy, again, in Jim Crow era, South, technically segregated, learning on the, on the field of play, uh, we, we make each other better by competing against each other. So I, f I found that to be... A lesson that even today is important to hold on to. So I, w I did want to add, kind of, this kind of goes into the public history gap that I'm discussing. Um, many of the black Razorbacks were high school aged uh, and young men and Fable didn't have an all black high school. So it makes sense they would have formed their own community team in lieu of that. But elsewhere in Arkansas, including right here in Little Rock, of course, in South and East Arkansas, you did have all black high schools with their own teams before integration. And from the 30s through the mid 60s, they had their own statewide athletic and activities association. So this is one of the few known, as far as I know, one of the, the few known photos of, of a piece of memorabilia from what was then called the Arkansas Colored Athletic Association. These are not very commonplace. Um, it, it took me years to even for Henry Linton over there at UPB to say, here we have this, and he was nice enough to email it to me. Over the years, this association existed parallel to the All-White Athletics Association, which is now known as the Arkansas Activity Association, has that name to this day. Uh, the two associations integrated in the mid-1960s. And it's important to note, there's an enormous gap between the recorded public history for this association and the, the all-white one, which is known as Arkansas Activity Association. One reason is newspaper coverage. Um, from 2007, 2010, I, I worked as a general assignment reporter and a feature obit writer at the Democrat Gazette. And I had some supervisors who allowed me to write about local history and cover fascinating speeches at the Clinton School of Public Service and things like that. And one of my favorite places to lose myself in research was the morgue, uh, the downstairs archives at the, the headquarters of the Democrat Gazette in Little Rock. And there you have row after row of filing cabinets. In each filing cabinet, you have hundreds of clips from the Democrat and the Gazette and Democrat Gazette dating back decades and decades and decades uh, before the two newspapers merged in 91. So both of these papers, especially the Gazette, provided some coverage of all black sports teams. Here's an example of a 1954 article. If, it's hard to read, but they actually list out all the teams at, um, in, 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 the, the, uh, in football in that all-black association. Um, but on the whole, the coverage was scant. The lion's share went to the all-white schools, which is not surprising considering the advertising base for the papers was usually white-owned businesses. Meanwhile, some black communities had their own papers. So perhaps the best known of these is the Arkansas State Press. Um, it was an advocacy paper established by Elsie Bates and Daisy Bates, who'd go on to become one of Little Rock Nine's advisors, or their, their main advisor. And based in Little Rock, uh, this paper did regularly cover black high school sports and college sports. 
One of its main sports writers is the now uh, deceased Sonny Walker, um, who would, in a, he himself become a pioneer under Winthrop Rockefeller administration in the 60s, but in the 50s, he was writing as, as a teacher at Horace Mann, he was doing this on the side, and he told me stories of Hardscrabble Field in Southwest Little Rock, where local all-black community teams would play against barnstorming teams featuring the likes of Satchel Paige and Jackie Robinson coming to Little Rock. So he unfortunately is deceased now, but I did get to talk to him some about this before he passed away. I'm sure he wrote about this in the state press itself, but I haven't been able to find those articles yet. Despite the efforts of Walker and others, the state press's capacity to chronicle black school, uh, black school events was dwarfed by the Gazette's and the Democrats' capacity to chronicle news involving white schools. The difference here is in the orders, is an order of magnitudes. So, uh, let me go ahead and go forward here. Not yet. So consider the combined number of years that the Gazette and the Democrat were both in operation uh, plus the 26 years since the merger totals 311 years in, in, in all. By comparison, the state press was published for a total of 31 years, so kind of superficially 10 to 1 ratio, but that doesn't begin to explain it. On top of that, the Democrat, the Gazette, and the Demgas, they have all published daily. The uh, state press, meanwhile, published weekly. So they're, you can time seven. And the state press published uh, for... For, for socioeconomic population reasons, the white-owned papers dwarfs the state press in terms of sheer number of pages produced per issue as well. A Sunday Democrat Gazette, for instance, uh, chimes in maybe more than 100 pages. Each state press issue chimed in at eight pages. So you can kind of see there's just this enormous gap. And on top of that now, you have Gazette and Democrat articles that are microfilm and digitized to where you can access them. The state press, meanwhile, some are, are digitized, but some are just missing. Like from the year 1963, for instance, not, it's not the um, State History Commission. There are just gaps even in what we've, what we've kept. So newspaper coverage is one reason for that huge chasm. Uh, the other reason is that the high school sports records were not integrated. Today, if you open the official record book of the Arkansas Activity Association, you can read all the state champions lists in all the major sports dating back to the early 1900s. Previous to 1966, however, all the lists of champions reflect what were then all white schools. Same goes for the most part for any individual or team record uh, previous to 66, again reflecting whites from all white schools. Um, so based on the official record book as it currently existed, exists, it's as if the all black school, most of the all black schools and the all, the all the black stars never existed. And th by the way, this is not an oversight. Like the, the uh, AAA well understands the issue. Uh, one of its former record keepers, Wadey Moore, he spent years t trying to track down some of these records of these schools. The problem is many of them have been lost or destroyed. When schools integrated in the 1960s, it was usually the white schools which remained standing and the black schools which were raised or converted into junior high or elementary schools. So it's often unclear what happened to the yearbooks, what happened to the pictures, the trophies, and the records housed in that black school. Some were put into storage and private residences and tracking down which private residence and what's there is, is a task for like a future public history Indiana Jones or something. I mean, it's very challenging to even figure out where to go to find the right gate, gate, gatekeeper in many cases. Um, this disappearance of records into the mist is what happened with the All Black Athletic Association, and it, it, which was headquartered at Scipio Jones High in North Little Rock in the early 1960s, that much we do know. Um, but I can't find anybody who happens to know what happened to the records after the school closed, but I'm hopeful that someone is still alive who knows. I think it's not too late potentially to recover a vital bit of history before it seemingly slips through the cracks forever. And I, I wanna say I think this is a golden age for public history projects involving state heritage. Uh, many of the adults who were alive in the 40s through early 60s are still alive now and they, they have this history that some are eager to share. Um, the, the, as I mentioned earlier, many of these Gazette and state press and um, Democrat articles dating back to the 20s have been digitized. 
They are available now to research through a website like genealogybank.com. So that's there. Um, I think it's possible, for instance, you could just go in, compile a year-by-year -year list of the all-black school state champions from this association, and you know uh, you, that would be a very valuable addendum to the current official record as it exists. It'd be a very valuable supplement, and that all it's needed is desire, time, maybe an incentive like school credit, something like that. So also, other states have established templates for commemorating sports heritage, which Arkansans can follow. So we don't even have to, we, we have a template right here. This is from Texas from a few years ago. It's called Thursday Night Lights. Um, Thursday nights is when the, a lot of the all black schools played because it was fr on Friday nights were reserved for the white uh, schools playing in that stadium. So they shared the same stadium many times, just like they did with Quigley Stadium, with Dunbar, you know, with Little Rock Central. Um, so Dunbar played on Thursday night, Central played on Friday night and quickly. And this, this was the Prairie View Interscholastic League was, their, was Texas's all black uh, sports league. So much bigger, many more people, many more schools. And in today's Texas, m more wealth. So they, they, they do this, it exists. They commemorate it um, at different events on an annual uh, level. And I think our Cantons could organize something along these lines. Maybe not as grand as what Texas has, but I think here we could do something similar. We have our own rich heritage to honor, and the focus doesn't have to be just on sports. You could expand it into other spheres. Uh, the key is to find those relics and that memorabilia and conduct the interviews before it's too late. So I know you all have some questions. I want to kind of get to that. Um, before I wrap this part up, though, I want to give a quick factoid about a guy named Eddie Miles. Eddie Miles was a, a great basketball player out of North Little Rock. He's still alive. In, he's in Seattle. But in the late 1950s, he was so good that uh, the Razorback coach, Glenn Rose, and Frank Boyles both wanted to make him the first official black Razorback uh, uh, in the early 60s. They wanted to make him that. So um, growing up in the 1950s, though, he, he told me that he played both football and basketball and that he admired a guy named Bruce Fullerton, who was an uh, all-American running back out of Little Rock Central High in, in that era. And I think it's you know, important to note that Fullerton was a white man who played with and against other all-white teams in this era. But to Miles, that didn't matter. He wanted to be like Fullerton anyway. He saw and he respected a greatness that transcended skin color. And I, don't, I just want to kind of wrap this by saying I don't view heritage as a zero-sum game. This book, on the surface, is African-American athletes in Arkansas, but it's really race relations. It's blacks and it's whites. And it's about how both came together. I don't think heritage is a contest. I think by learning more about what blacks have achieved in the past, whites don't lose their own history if they choose to think about their own past in those terms. And at the same time, I think the same goes for blacks, learning more about what whites have achieved. From my own experience, if you start looking deeply enough, you'll find our histories often aren't so separate after all. Thank you very much. Let's take questions and uh, please wait for the microphone to, yes, sir. Familiar face going to ask the first question. You beat Andy. Which, yeah, I know. <laughs> That's right. You beat Andy, which is a pretty good, you're quick to the draw. That's right. Hey, Evan, um, I appreciate what you said about uh, what happened in Fayetteville. I would, be, I would think the audience would like to hear the background of Harmon Field. I used to kick field goats there on Sunday afternoons when I was a student at the U of A. Yeah, I mean, uh, Harmon Field named after a... Um, a great philanthropist uh, and supporter of African-American arts in the 1920s. He kind of gave money to multiple uh, fields and municipal playgrounds all across the nation. Um, there was a little bit, uh, and I kind of allude to it in the book, a little bit of controversy about the, the Fayetteville uh, black Razorbacks were initially allowed to play at Harmon Field, which was named again after a philanthropist who um, helped African-Americans around the nation, but then um, it, we're not clear about the reason, but they were apparently kicked off, and they had to go somewhere farther out of town to practice in the 30s. Questions? Anybody else got questions? There you go, Miss Abrams. 
Annie. First, first, I want to thank you for providing this valuable Arkansas history. Thank you. As Skip knows that I am a historian, and history has no color. It's just that it wasn't always recorded. The thing that's so important is that sports have united us next to the blues, music, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. art. And so for you to do this, there are times when I'm so excited, but then there are times when I'm saddened. When I think of where the athletes of today are, mm -hmm. and to look at this crowd, and I remember when my husband used to work here when it was a train station, to see such few African American in this audience tonight. I thought I was gonna have to get somebody to park my car. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. But the thing that's important is that you have contributed greatly, greatly to the history of Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Now, the AAA, the mm -hmm. one that still exists, mm -hmm. I go back in two roles. One is, my stepdaughter was the first African-American that worked in that office. And I had the man, Glenda, mm -hmm. I had the man who was the sports goddess <laughs> mm -hmm. to hire her so that she could help him wreck you know, some of the people. And so Glenda was there for a long, mm -hmm. long time. But also I had another opportunity was at the morgue of the Arkansas mm -hmm. Gazette. Mm -hmm. Wanda Bynum, who is one of our democratic leaders today, African American, lost her job when the two papers mm -hmm. merged. Mm -hmm. My boys were paper boys for the state press, which I have some of those. Mm -hmm. They were also paper boys for the Democrat because I didn't want to get up early enough for them to go and get the Gazette. <laughs> <laughs> so I have had a special relationship with all of the papers, those black papers that came and then eradicated themselves by no advertisement. Mm -hmm. And I also know that with Walter Hussman, I talk with him just like I do with Rick, mm -hmm. how frightened we all are of what technology is going to do Mm. that we won't have the hard copies mm. that you were seeking. But on September the 25th, I'll be 86. Mm. And because I wanted to make sure that there will be some archival hard copies of things, I was the key leader in a committee called Unity in the Community. And I led that committee to please, let's plant a time capsule. Hmm. Now look at this little boy right here. <laughs> okay, now we got to come on. And get know, to, we got to get to your question. Uh, the, the question gonna be at the end. End. <laughs> I know, but well, I've got other people that want to ask uh, a I question. I see nobody with me. Well, you there. just missed them. <laughs> so ask your question. Okay. okay, the question is, how do you believe we can get more people to just love history and benefit from it? It's a good question. Um, th that was part of the reason I wrote the book was, is it possible to use sports as a Trojan horse to open up uh, specifically high schoolers today in junior, junior high, middle school, in high school, to get, especially boys, there may be sports crazy, to get them to care about uh, education, ish, uh, civil rights history, all of these things from the past in an interdisciplinary way, through the portal of sports. I mean, the, the Ali, the, the name Ali commands attention, Black Razorback set commands attention, but I did want to use it as a, a, a kind of a Trojan horse. Yeah, thank you. Yes, question. There you go, she's coming. Right. Okay, um, understanding the power of sports as being a unifying force, um, what do you see as the role um, with everything happening in an NFL, specifically with Colin Kaepernick, um, where do you see the role of white athletes in standing in solidarity with him? I should preface this by saying, as I said earlier, I, I don't pretend to be an expert in African American culture or history, and, and the issues that Kaepernick is bringing up and Black Lives Matter, those are issues that I am not an expert in in, in the capacity. Um, 
I mean, I, I, I would say that I like the fact that when a white athlete stand, um, uh, makes, a, makes a stand or kneels, either way, that does open up an avenue for conversation, which it did reach us recently. Um, because the f one of the things that I'm trying to wrap my mind around as, as a white man, I mean, I, I don't feel 100% white, but I would consider myself white, even though I have a, a Turkish father, and I, I, I grew up somewhat different. I would consider myself more of a white man than anything else. But this, it's just to kind of explain where, where I'm going with this, um, it's important to understand frames of reference. And I know growing up in Arkansas, going to U of A, graduating from the U of A all these years, in my 36 years, I never once thought the way, I, I talked to an African-American man who went up there, he coached there for the Razorbacks, he got a, a PhD there, and he told me, when I look at this diploma, I see the year 1871 as the year that this university, our state flagship university was chartered, 1871. But for me, I don't feel it that 1871 chartered for me and my kind. That was 1948 when Silas Hunt integrated the law school. I'd never once thought in those terms until he sh told that to me. And that changing of a frame of reference was important and I, I would hope that things like this with the kneeling can do the same. Other questions? I've got one that, that I want to ask about. The, the missing records, mm -hmm. the, 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 uh, the activities association, the copies of the state press. Um, Annie's got some of them. We need to let, make sure she lets you look at them so you can, if you go to her museum, you can find okay. a bunch of stuff. But how do we make an appeal to people? Somebody, there's got to be in somebody's attics, there's got to be, there's got to be records out there that, that, that somebody kept. How can we do a better job of, of now letting people know what we're looking for? I, I think uh, one, one way to do that would just be create a, like a digital state heritage project of some sort where you have a map of the state of Arkansas and you're very, it's very simple. You, you just want to geolocate where every all black school was across the state. And then you want to get an actual photo of what that school looked like. That in itself is a task for some of the schools put it on this, the site where when you roll over it, here are the photos, here's what we know, like a bio of that school. You can use that as a, as a ground level for the project. And off of that, you could go to social, a thing like social media here would be powerful in terms of Facebook pages. A lot of these all black schools still have uh, alumni associations. You would want to go there first, I think, and then kind of work your way in that direction. Rex? <clears throat> make one comment. Uh, I think what you said, Evan, about capturing a lot of these people before those memories are gone are, are so important. I, I thought I'd mention tonight, just since we were on the subject, uh, day before yesterday, uh, we lost one of our really fine Arkansans and somebody with whom I'd become a friend, Dr. Clifton Rofe of uh, Pine Bluff. Mm -hmm. Of course, his son, mm -hmm. Willie mm -hmm. Rofe, is in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, is also in the College Football Hall of Fame. Dr. Rofe, though, um, was at Merrill High School, the all-black high school in Pine Bluff, and the International Paper Company had hired an economics professor to come down and study all the schools, black and white, in Pine Bluff in 1958. Hmm. And that professor uh, went to Merrill, and Merrill said, look, we've got a guy that's smart enough, he's going to be our valedictorian, but he's a good athlete, too. And Clifton Rofe was the first of Duffy Doherty's uh, blacks that he pulled out of the South because white universities weren't recruiting mm -hmm. them. He, he was the first mm. and uh, went to Michigan State and uh, met a bright young lady from Nashville, Tennessee called Andre Layton, who would become the first black woman to serve on the Arkansas Supreme mm. Court. And, and that was through sports that there's, he got to Michigan sports. State. Wow. So, you know, we've lost Dr. Rofe yeah. this week, but it's important that we save those kind of stories while we, while we still can. I agree. And, and, and by the way, a lot of those, some of those stories are currently in the Democrat Gazette anthology, Untold Stories. Unfortunately, that book is out of print, which it shouldn't be. It should be back in print. It should, there should be an ebook version. That should be in every library in the state. Question, Wes. All right, so recently under fire, we've, or recently we've seen ESPN come under fire for taking social uh, stances. 
What do you think the role of sports writers is uh, in the current uh, political climate and cultural landscape? Uh, I would hope to report the, the, the facts, the truth, but are, are you asking kind of even beyond that, should there be colonizing? and have okay, yeah, like in a social aspect, do sports reporters have responsibility to, to talk beyond sports and talk about how sports impacts the, the larger social landscape? I think some of that probably boils down to um, the, what, what you mean by rep a, rep a, true, a true reporter, as from my training, would be someone who is reporting what happened. They're not trying to inject their own thoughts and opinions into the piece. They're not writing it in any kind of op-ed or column way. Uh, but beyond that, I do think there's a role certainly for sports columnists, sports op-ed writers, uh, and political op-ed writers and columnists to, to, to comment on what's happening now. I don't think there's any reason to, to shy away from mixing politics and sports. Uh, I, th I think on the East Coast and in the North, there are a lot more ready to do that. Dave Zirin has a politics and sports podcast, which is exactly about that intersection. In the South, it seems we're more reticent to do that. Yes, sir, we got a question. There comes the microphone. Skip, don't limit me to just a question. You might need a pen for this. Okay. <laughs> okay. I want to know when you started your research. I want to know if you um, went through 40 minutes of hell um, Nolan Richardson's book uh, mm -hmm. as part of uh, your thought process about it. I can't recall Dr. Lonnie Williams' book right now, but he was at the University of Arkansas. Re Re Remembrances in Black? Right, yeah. right, and yeah. if you related to that mm -hmm. one. And um, I'd like to kind of know on the front end what your treatment was about Daryl Brown uh, in your book. And my observation is this, from an optic standpoint and uh, a feeling standpoint, uh, I appreciated your comments earlier when you talked about the black athletes kneeling and then the white athlete putting his hand on him. Mm -hmm. From your vantage point, that's viewed as a good thing. From people like myself, that's viewed as a bad thing because it's like he has to be co-signed on by a white person before what he is doing is okay. So that makes it a little bit de minimis uh, and it points out, seems to be more of the problem uh, with how things are viewed uh, mm. until it has a white imprimatur on it, it's not a good thing yet. Mm. Uh, yeah. So if I, if I didn't lose you, mm -hmm. let me know when you started your research and uh, you related to those other works mm -hmm. and your treatment of Daryl Brown. Yeah, uh, um, uh, Daryl Brown, and to kind of to wrap the Daryl Brown and 40 Minutes together, I did have the honor of, of meeting Daryl Brown in person at an, as a Nolan Richardson Multicultural Hall of Fame induction, gosh, 2011 or something like that. And uh, the, the biographer of Nolan Richardson, who wrote that, that book, Russ Bradbird, he's a friend of mine, very generous man. Um, he introduced me and he said, Evan, you, you, you should write about Daryl Brown. His story is unbelievable, amazing. Dan Wetzel for Yahoo did write a, a pretty good piece, uh, article about that. But yeah, he's someone who prob probably should have had a book written, written about him. He's unfortunately passed away. Um, and then the, the book itself is an anthology. So some of the stories that were previously published in the Democrat Gazette or North Little Rock Times or Slate. And I think the earliest, I would say, would date around that time, 2011 or so. Got time for one more question. Anybody got a final question? Well, if not, let's thank Evan and let's all come visit with him while we buy and sign his book. Thank you. Thank you.